תודה. בבקשה, אני לא מדבר עברית, רק אנגלית, בסדר? And now that I've used up most of my Hebrew, yeah, RFC 3514 is one of my most favorite pieces of writing, so... So, one of the things that we have to realize in this business is that things change constantly. The single biggest mistake you can make in the technology business is to use yesterday's answers to today's questions without rethinking them. Of course, the second biggest mistake is to ignore yesterday's answers because sometimes they're still correct. And, uh, but yeah, again, things really do change and change a lot. And this really matters. I mean, Let's take, let me take one example that's got little to do with security. In Unix, unlike almost any other operating system developed before it, every process had its own address space. And we take advantage of that. It's a wonderful security property today. Sometimes it gets in the way, but usually it's a good thing. But why did it happen? It happened because on the machines in which Unix was first developed, you only had a 16-bit address space. And if you wanted to have a lot of processes, you really weren't going to be able to fit very, many, very much program into 16 bits of address space, even with the way they wrote programs in 1974. This is an architectural decision made because of the technological constraints of the time. I think it's the right one for today, but it pays to look at it again. So things change constantly. And as you can see, we don't even always understand what the comments were and what the constraints were. But it's more than just language that changes. Businesses change. Many of us are involved in jobs, professions that were unimaginable not very many years ago. I mean, the, the, the thought of a computer that I can carry in my pocket that is far more powerful than a whole room full of computers when I started programming almost 50 years ago. You couldn't think about such a thing back then. And of course, the threats change. There's a story, there was a, uh, a bank robber in New York named Willie Sutton, oh, 75 or so years ago. And according to legend, he was once asked by a reporter as he was being led away, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Well, we have new forms of money and new ways to uh, steal the money. And of course, the bad guys are followed along. And most obviously, in the uh, computer security business, the computer business, the technology changes. So we have to adapt. The first question to ask in the security context, what are you trying to protect and against whom? Until you can answer these questions, you walk into a room and somebody says, I want you to design a security system. And you start sketching firewalls and passwords and biometrics and encryption. And you don't know what you're doing if you do it that way, because you don't know what it is you're trying to protect. And you don't know who the enemies are. Defenses that keep out the teenager down the street are not going to keep out the NSA. By the way, the NSA has two halves. There's the signals intelligence part. They're the ones who are going around spying on everybody. But then there's the information assurance people. They're the ones trying to protect everybody. And you always have to know to whom you're talking. It's not always clear. And they fight internally. Uh, there's a whole story about DES. You know, when DES was uh, first released, 1974, I guess it was, uh, people, did the NSA tamper with the S-boxes? Well, we know as of 1991, with the differential cryptanalysis was reinvented. Yes, they tampered with it. They made it stronger. But we also, there's also pretty good evidence that they shortened the key length from 112 bits to 56 bits to satisfy the other part of the NSA. Which part are you talking to? Different assets demand different levels of protection. You know, the pictures that got released on the internet a week ago were obviously very valuable to some people. 
as compared with this very ordinary picture of the moon, you can just barely see in the upper right-hand corner Jupiter. They were very close together in apparent view. If you, uh, a couple of years ago, I took this picture. No one would pay anything for it. It's not nearly a good enough picture. This asset is valueless. Other pictures are very valuable. And this means that the security measures we take have to be commensurate with the value of the assets we're trying to protect. You don't want to spend too much on security to protect something that's not worth very much. Different kinds of assets attract different kinds of hackers. The NSA is probably not interested in nude pictures of actresses. Maybe some NSA analysts are, I don't know. But the NSA's mission as a whole doesn't include collecting such things. On the other hand, if they're pictures of some of their targets in such poses and positions, that might be interesting to them. Some parts of the intelligence community like knowing nasty things about some people they might want to deal with. But the NSA is really interested in military and political information. Yeah, they collect all this stuff, but that's mostly a side effect. They, they would eliminate if they could, not because it's just, they have to go wade through all this stuff and sort it. They don't want excess stuff. Most hackers that are out there on the internet today, though, want money. And this change happened about 10 or 12 years ago, and it caught the computer security community by surprise. Suddenly, viruses appeared, worms appeared, that were clearly very professionally developed. What was the point of this? Who was developing a virus like this? Why? It took six to 12 months for people to realize, oh, virus rate, spam rate, they're correlated. Have you noticed that there hasn't been a worm that shut down the internet for about a dozen years? You know why? There's no profit in it. You know, why shut off your income stream? These people are making money when they can send spam and steal passwords. They can't do that if the internet is down. <laughs> Where the money is. And that means that most of the hackers are going after things that they can monetize, that way, things that they can turn into money in some fashion. But there are many different classes of hackers. And they've got different skills and different goals. They also differ in another more subtle respect. Are they after you in particular? Or are they after anybody they happen to be able to get? Even the NSA works that way. Sometimes they collect everything. Sometimes they really drill down and go after a particular target. I put it together with this uh, little, I've drawn it as four uh, different quadrants, but they're really degrees. How skilled is the attacker, and how much are they after you in particular? And you need to understand where you fit with regard to particular attackers along this graph in order to understand what defenses you want to deploy. So in the lower left, not very skilled, and going after nobody in particular, I call the joy hackers. This is the teenager down the street. This is the kind that Hollywood starts believing in. They don't, they're not very skilled. Sometimes they're just starting out. They run, something's called script kiddies. They find a script, you know, click here to attack this system. They don't realize sometimes it's attacking their system, but you know, they're just starting out. They're not very good at target selection. If they succeed in hacking anything, it's a victory. Hey, I just hacked such and such. Cool. Right. Anything they succeed against. There's a story I once read. A soldier of the uh, Tsar's army was riding in this little village looking for soldiers for the Tsar's army. And he sees the side of a barn with bullet holes in a very tiny circle and chalk around each bullet hole. Who is the marksman who can shoot so accurately? 
He asked and asked, he asked around the village, and finally got an answer. You can shoot so accurately? No, I just shoot at the barn. Every place I make a hole, I draw a circle. That's the way it is with some of these joy hackers. They can do damage, you, but ordinary care will protect against them. You don't need to be particularly skillful, but you do need to be a little bit careful. Not to click on all the random pieces of email that promise you great riches or uh, pictures or what have you. The opportunist, opportunistic hackers are more serious. They're skilled, often very, very skilled. But again, they're not trying to get somebody in particular. They are the people who write most of the viruses out there. Viruses, for the most part, spread pretty randomly. Whoever happens to go click on something, download it, what have you, gets infected, and maybe it's useful to them. They're good. They're good enough to develop these viruses. But again, they're not trying to do it. Again, another old joke. Two people are walking in the woods, and they say, see a bear, and one starts running. What are you doing? You can't outrun the bear. No, but I can outrun you. Against this class of hacker, you just try to outrun everybody else. You need to be careful about your defenses because they are quite good. But they're not going after you specifically. An attack that, if you do anything a little bit non-standard, you're probably safe. So you read that, these, that some group of hackers has got a wonderful exploit against SSH, which runs on TCP port 22. You run your, TC, your SSH on port 122, you're probably perfectly safe because everybody else is running it on 22, and they're not targeting you. They're targeting anybody who happens to have this exploit. Most of the time, they want money. How do they get it? Steal credit card numbers, plant keystroke loggers, and uh, capture bank account passwords, turn machines into uh, bots to send spam, and so on. They cause a lot of trouble, a lot of pain, we know how to defend against them. In the lower right, uh, I didn't quite make up the word targeteer. It's by analogy with bombardier. The word existed a few hundred years ago, but I'm changing its meaning. I need a word for these people. It's, these are attackers who are after you specifically, but may not be very skillful. And they're dangerous for a different reason, not because of the skill, but because they're focusing on you and they're doing research. Oh, this person's not running SSH on port 22. Let me do a port scan and see what port seems to be SSH. I want to go send a, not just a phishing email, but a spear phishing email. Spear phishing, you need to know, sound credible, you need to know the name of somebody who might be sending such an email and what the topic would be. They may even be an insider or a former insider. Companies that have been engaged in rounds of layoffs have, uh, are often uh, su susceptible to this. Why? Because these people know. They may even take advantage of, fit of being physically near to the target. Oh, let's take Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, unencrypted, dangerous protocol. But the range is only about 300 meters. With a good antenna, maybe you can get a kilometer or two. But, you know, if I'm in New York and my target, and a company that's uh, in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, is not at risk from a Wi-Fi attack from me, I can't reach it. If I really want to get somebody, though, I can travel nearby and point my antenna at their network. <coughs> Suddenly, they're more susceptible. These are the people who are after you. They're dangerous because they're targeting you and can look at the little quirks and weaknesses. Take advantage of certain things. Here. I walked into my building, back when I was at AT&T Labs, for six months, I walked into my building showing 
my badge, the back of my badge. It looked just like this, completely blank. And I walked in for six months, and nobody paid any attention. Well, as somebody who worked there, I knew just how much attention the guards were paying to badges. There are other places where I know that a, a trick like that would not work. But if you're, tar if you're targeting somebody, oh, you walk in the front door to go ask for somebody, oh, I don't have an appointment? Well, I'll come back later. But in the meantime, you're observing the, the behavior of the guards while everybody else is walking in. The upper right quadrant, the people who are targeting you specifically and are very skilled, the advanced persistent threat. These are the people we really have to worry about. They're very good and they want you. They're doing the research and they've got the tools. The best attackers in this class are the national intelligence agencies, like the NSA, like assorted people in this country from all news accounts, you know the country is on that list as well as I do. These are the people who are creating, discovering and exploiting the so-called zero-day attacks. Attacks for which no patches exist because the vendor doesn't know about it. They may uh, use advanced cryptographic techniques, like the uh, flame piece of, of uh, malware known as Flame, discovered, uh, I believe, in Iran. Seemed to be spying. And, Flame had the very curious property, not seen in any other piece of publicly described malware, that it used a previously unknown cryptanalytic technique. You know, I can imagine a large criminal organized crime gang putting together a massive piece of software to attack something. It's rather harder to imagine the average large organized criminal gang discovering new cryptanalytic techniques. Okay. Here's a new technique. Do I publish it in crypto or do I write some spyware? Who's going to do the latter? This is not organized crime. This is a national intelligence agency. And uh, these are the people, again, if it's a national intelligence agency who employ what are sometimes known as the three Bs. And I got this phrase from somebody who uh, used to work for the NSA. In fact, it was Bob Morris, the elder, former uh, chief scientist of the NSA's National Computer Security Center. That's on the information assurance side, by the way. I knew Bob from Bell Labs, and he said, okay, three Bs. Burglary, bribery, and blackmail. You know, when I want to publish a paper at crypto, I need a nice new academic technique. When an intelligence agency wants to get some data, a nice new academic technique is one way to do it. But if you can slip a guy a few thousand dollars, It'll get you the information. That works too. They don't really care. The, the issue for an intelligence agency is not whether or not it's cool academically, but does it work and at what cost? And cost could be exposure, risk of exposure. When we're dealing with these very high-end attackers, we have no high assurance defenses. We can put in all our firewalls and all our cryptography and all our authentication and all our virus scanners and everything else we can think about. And you know what? They may still be better because they're really, really good and they're doing research. But the phrase ABD, advanced persistent threat, I'm a fan of old science fiction and this book is from about 100 years ago that I got this quote from. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs was the guy who, wrote, who came up with Tarzan. Uh, anyway, uh, why do so many companies, when they get hacked in the papers, they say, oh, it must have been the Chinese, it must have been the advanced persistent threat. Where I think they're, I don't think they're deluding themselves, but they're bragging, we're so good that nobody else could have gotten us. Oh, we're good, they got us, therefore they must be better, right? Not, we were careless, or uh, we didn't do what we should have done, or we're not as good as we think. So people are bragging about, uh, you have to get hacked, talk about how good you have to be. Oh, we're good enough to be targets. Who are the APTs? Well, the U.S. is always blaming Russia and China. Russia and China blame the U.S. Iran blames Israel. Israel bl blames Iran, or maybe Palestinians backed by Iran. I'm not going to take sides. Yeah. The, uh, 
Uh, I'm just going to refer to the, the, these high-end attackers as being from the Andromeda galaxy. I figure that they're not going to come complain to me. They're not also not going to buy very many of my books, so the Andromeda galaxy. So when we're trying to protect a system, what do we have to do? We have to start by assessing the risks. What assets do you have? And as computer people, we're not very good people to assess the risks because, the assets rather, because we don't run the corporation for the most part. What you think is important might not actually be where the money is. On the other hand, the financial types who do run the companies don't necessarily understand what it costs to build certain databases. So coming up with this understanding of the assets to be protected is an interactive, iterative process. But you should not, as a computer person, do it by yourself. You know, even if you're one part of the company, you don't even and have a very good understanding of that uh, part of the business, you don't necessarily understand what's going on in the rest of the company. In fact, very often different parts of the company don't know what's going on in other parts of the company. They, they may be spying on each other, I don't know. Once you figure out what it is you've got that somebody else wants, what classes of attackers are going to go after it? You know, if you're a financial firm, maybe you know, it's pretty obvious. It's the money. If you are a defense contractor, yeah, someone might want the money, but it might be another government wanting defense secrets. It might be a national intelligence agency operating on behalf of commercial interests in their country. France has been accused of that for 20 years. I know people whose corporate policy was that they should not fly Air France. Executives should not fly Air France for that reason. So there are reports in the U.S. that a paint manufacturer was hacked by Chinese government agents. Why? Because this formulation of paint was useful to a Chinese paint manufacturer. What classes of attackers are interested? You know, in Britain there have been all kinds of trials and convictions about newspapers uh, employing quote hacking unquote techniques to get information on paparazzi, for the paparazzi. Once you know what you've got, and once you know who's interested, then you have to figure out how powerful they are, what kinds of attacks they can launch. And finally, and this point is very important, how much security can you afford? Bob Morris, another guy from whom I learned computer security at the labs, uh, Fred Gramp, wrote an article about 30 years ago where they said it was very easy to build a secure computer system. You just stick it in a vault with armed guards outside and turn the power off. Well, that's not very good for usability. Even if you don't turn the power off, it's still a lot less useful than something that I can get to from halfway around the world. There's a cost to certain kinds of security measures, and you have to decide if the cost is worth it. It is very important to remember that the purpose of a business, it could be another organization, but I'll just say businesses uh, for shorthand, the purpose of a business is not to stay secure. The business has goals of its own, making money, advocating a particular cause for a lobbying group, being a government. The purpose is not to be secure. The purpose is to carry out some other, larger goal. Insecurity is a cost. It's not, you have not committed a sin if you're insecure. You have lost money. Well, if I spend too much on security, I'm losing money also. I may be hurting productivity. How much do you spend on security? How much do you think you're protecting? What is the cost of being penetrated? 
Sometimes it could, you know, there are companies that have been put out of business by hacks. Obviously, that's very considerable. But most of the time, it's not that. Most of the, much of the time, you might find that recovery is cheap, not that recovery is cheap. When Target got hacked and 40 million credit card numbers stolen, there are estimates of the total cost to Target that, that the total cost will exceed $1 billion. It's a lot of money, even by American corporate standards. Home Depot has reportedly been hacked. Many more credit card numbers stolen. That one looks like to be a much larger hack. We don't have all the details yet on that one. Probably they should have done more. We don't know yet. But again, we need to understand the trade-off. And I'll repeat, being insecure is not a moral failing. It's an economic decision. It is perfectly reasonable to omit certain security measures if the cost is too high or the protective value is too low. But you have to be very, very careful to make sure you understand the assets that are at risk and who might be after them. It's not always obvious. Generally speaking in this business, it's best to be more secure than you think because you don't under, always understand the attackers, and the attackers keep getting better also. The attackers have gotten a lot better at target selection over the years. Do not rely on the obscurity of your company or your industry to protect you. One of the biggest hacks of credit card numbers in the US before target was a company called Heartland Payment Systems, so-called credit card processor. This was a industry I didn't even know existed. I thought that credit cards were being processed directly by the banks. No, there's actually an intermediary in there, the, the processors, and Heartland pay, Payment Systems was one of them. So the attackers understood the industry well enough to realize that there was this group of small companies that don't have the sophistication of the banks, but nevertheless had something extremely valuable, lots and lots and lots of credit card numbers. And you know, passwords, yeah, we can see why someone wants a, pa a password to a bank account, but people reuse passwords. I'll be saying a lot more about passwords tomorrow, but people cannot remember all the password, a separate password for every site they use these days. And this means that if I get your password to Facebook or LinkedIn, that's probably your password to something else that's more valuable. So someone will hack my social networking site to go after that credit card site. There's a uh, company in the US called StubHub. They sell tickets to sporting events. If you don't, you have tickets to a baseball game, a football game, basketball game, you don't want it, you put up for sale on StubHub. There was recently a spate of uh, fake transactions, and the attackers got away with a lot of money. How did this happen? StubHub wasn't hacked. The security was fine. The attackers used passwords apparently stolen from Adobe a few months earlier. Adobe got badly hacked, and Adobe was fairly stupid at the way they protected passwords. These passwords were reused on StubHub to sell tickets that didn't exist, or to buy tickets and resell them for cash. You don't always know exactly what's, uh, what's useful to the attacker. But their target selection has gotten very good. It's, and again, it's been getting very good for a long time. 20 years ago, there was a, about 20, 1993, there was an advisory that attackers had somehow managed to plant network sniffers on the internet and was stealing passwords from unencrypted traffic. 
It was not easy to use encryption in 1993 because there was very little of it standardized. If they were stealing passwords, if you've logged it over the internet, change your password. Great. We all knew this attack in the security community, we all knew this attack was possible. What was not widely discussed was just what machines the attackers had targeted. It turned out, for reasons that are no longer interesting, that ISPs tended to have Sun workstations sitting on their backbone cables. And Ethernet was not switched in 1993. If you were on the cable, you could see all of the traffic. The attackers had learned this, how I don't know, had identified the particular machines that were located like this, how I don't know, and they successfully hacked these machines. So they were not just eavesdropping in random spots of the internet, but on the internet backbone itself, seeing an awful lot of traffic that was going by. Since 1993, at least, their target selection has been improving. An interesting example of an analysis gone wrong was the so-called WikiLeaks cables. When Manning, Bradley, then Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning, stole a lot of information from the US State Department. What had happened? The State Department, in conjunction with a lot of the rest of the US government, had concluded that there was too much compartmentalization in the way they were protecting information. There was not enough information sharing. This was one of the factors that the uh, investigating commission had said was responsible for the attack on the World Trade Center in 2001. So they made a very deliberate policy decision to loosen the compartmentalization. Anybody with a certain clearance level could get at most information at that level. Was the decision right or was the decision wrong? They said, our defenses against outside attackers are pretty good. We're not worried. Their defenses against inside attackers, they decided somehow, they decided there was not going to be an insider who was going to break the rules like this. Why they could come to that decision, I don't know. There's been plenty of precedent for insiders gone bad. But Manning stole 250,000 cables and sent them to Julian Assange at WikiLeaks. Their threat analysis was wrong. They understood the assets. They perhaps undervalued the assets. But they didn't understand the attacker's threats. Mobile phone cloning. 20, 25 years ago in the US, there was a serious problem about of phones being cloned. If you used your mobile phone in certain areas, somebody was going to pick up effectively the login and password, so-called electronic serial number, mobile identification number pair, over the air. It was not encrypted. And they just go program this into another phone. And all of the computer security people laughed. How could the designers of the mobile, analog mobile phone system have been so stupid that they didn't understand that you could pick up stuff over the air? Well, it turns out that the designers were not that stupid. They understood this risk perfectly well. They understood the risk. They got a couple of other things wrong. One. They thought the attack would be very costly to run. They thought that people would have to build custom gear to pick up these radio signals. You know, they, th they thought it would be very hard to actually do the interception. And they thought that the mobile phone market was so small that there wouldn't be enough such traffic to be worth anybody's while to do this. They also just didn't think there were enough electronics technicians who were capable of it. And they were wrong in just about every aspect. I don't have to tell you how mobile phone technology, the market, has grown. It grew faster and in unexpected directions in the early days in the US. It was seen as a service for executives. It turned out that uh, a lot of tradesmen, carpenters, plumbers, and so on, people without fixed offices found it very valuable. So the market became a lot broader earlier than anybody had figured. 
they also didn't realize that there were a lot of you know, TV repair technicians who had all the electronic skills necessary. They didn't realize that test gear, that the technicians needed to go monitor mobile phone networks, was going to become widely available. So you didn't have to build the intercept gear. You could just go buy it, mass produced, and it's cheaper. And they didn't really understand what the market was for these illegal clone phones. They thought, OK, mobile phone calls are very expensive. And they were 25 years ago. People who are uh, going to buy these illegal phones just want to save money. As long as the price keeps dropping, they knew the price would drop, though, drop more rapidly than they figured. We'll stay ahead of the market. There'll be no motive to, get to, to go to such trouble. But in fact, the market for illegal phones was from drug dealers and other criminals who wanted to avoid wiretaps. It was, much, it was easily, you're selling drugs on the street corner, it's easily worth your while to throw away your phone once a week and get a new phone number. Because then the wiretap order doesn't work anymore. You know, when the phone company first complained to police, the police reaction was, oh, so some giant corporation's losing a little bit of money with a crime we don't understand and have no idea how to investigate. Why should we really be interested? When the phone company came back to them and said, excuse me, it's not toll fraud, it's drug dealers and organized crime doing this, suddenly the police got interested. Suddenly they get law enforcement attention. But the problem was that the threat analysis was all wrong. And so we had this problem until they did the right thing eventually deploying cryptographic authentication. And misunderstanding threats can even happen to ordinary people. There's a family, I think it was in the American Midwest someplace, I don't remember just where, I think it might have been Milwaukee. They reported their neighbor to the police because he'd been doing seriously bad, you know, obnoxious things. They were right to report him. But he really was crazy and got angry at them. So he spent months monitoring their wireless traffic. You know, you're well within the 100 meter range of the Wi-Fi signal. He cracked their web password. Not a hard thing to do with the right software. He hacked into their computers and decided to take his revenge. He started putting child pornography on their computers, sending threatening emails claiming to be from these uh, people, threatening the life of vice president. You do that, and the US Secret Service finds out they're going to investigate, something they take very seriously. And, you know, and the police realized that this was all fraudulent, he investigated further and found out who it was. The family had assumed an opportunistic attacker. Maybe somebody driving by trying to see an open, find an open Wi-Fi signal. An ordinary encryption might have sufficed. Instead, they were the victims of a targeted attack. Somebody really wanted to get them, and in particular, not for financial motives, which makes it a lot, a lot harder to uh, understand. But they got the threat model very wrong and had quite a bit of trouble as a result. And then there's Stuxnet. Stuxnet knew that their uranium centrifuge plant was going to be targeted by they, they and you can, I can guess which, by which countries would not like Iran to have a centrifuge plant to enrich uranium. They knew they, that their risk was from serious adversaries. And they felt that an air gap no network connection between the plant's network and the rest of the internet would suffice. They were right about the serious adversaries. Stuxnet is an interesting case study in how professionals write malware. But the attackers had more powers than they had assumed and came up with something that jumped the air gap. I was a few years ago, I got a call from a uh, Hollywood screenwriter who wanted to put together a script on Stuxnet. And she asked me to explain to her what it was. And I explained, and I said, OK. And here's the way it worked. I finally said, somehow, there was a USB stick that got inserted into the plant's network. And we don't know how that happened. And this is where you can have 
James Bond or the beautiful blonde or what have you. Here's where you imagine. Maybe it's a commander. Let your imagination go wild here because there's not really a lot of evidence. I've got theories, but they're theories. And my theories are not nearly dramatic enough for Hollywood. Never made that movie that I know of. <laughs> Finally, I, there is the matter of assumptions. And this is where technology changes are coming into play. Why should changes in technology affect our security reasoning? Is it the speed of computers? Is it the new applications? Is it the increased network bandwidth? It turns out that a lot of our security architectures are built around assumptions we don't even realize we have made. And because we don't know what they are, we don't know, we don't know that we need to react when something has changed typically as a result of technology. We have to really try to identify those assumptions. You know, one example is passwords. Again, I'll be talking a lot more about passwords and authentication tomorrow, so I won't spend much time on it now. But it turns out that one of the assumptions behind standard password protection schemes is that the attackers had a fairly limited amount of computational power. You know, when uh, Morris and Thompson wrote their paper in 1979, which introduced salting and one-way hashing of passwords. Well, okay, we have a computer, large, it was a large so-called mini-computer of the day, a PDP-1170. Maybe the attackers will have access to a similar computer. Maybe they'll have two or three of them. It's hard to imagine the attack would have very many because there weren't that many. And how would one attacker get access to very many of these things? So they made an assumption about the attacker's computational power. Oh, yeah. Mar okay. Morris and Thompson talked about custom hardware in the hands of an intelligence agency, but that turned out to be a fairly minor part of their design. Today's attackers have botnets, sometimes with millions of computers. And every one of these computers has a GPU, a graphics processing unit, which you can use for password cracking. Many orders of magnitude more computational power than had been assumed in 1979. But this 1979 scheme is more or less the state of the art. When the attackers have many orders of magnitude more power. The defenders, more power doesn't really help very much. But the attackers have many orders of magnitude more. And what does this mean? It means that password guessing is far more effective than could have been done at the time. So you go back to 1979 and read the paper and they give the combinatorics about why an eight character password looks sufficient. It doesn't take a very sophisticated attacker today to be able to exhaustively search the entire space of eight character passwords. Not with today's computational power. But then you read sites that say password must be eight to 12 characters long. Why is eight as a minimum even vaguely acceptable? And why, why, why do you want 12 characters as a maximum? In fact, where did the eight characters come from? Because Morris and Thompson didn't have hash functions. Cryptic, you know, graphic hash functions didn't exist in 1979. They used the password as the key to a modified uh, DES implementation. DES would only take eight bytes. Eight characters, eight bytes, the combinatorics look good enough. Today we've got hash functions. Today we've got a lot more computational power. Eight to 12 characters. People have gotten that wrong technologically today because of this assumption that was implicit in the technology of 1979. Another thing about passwords. In 1979, who had access to a computer? Mostly employees or a few computer science students. Your employees you can train. If they don't listen, management can react in the way that only management knows how to. Today's computer users are mostly the world's population. 
If you're running a commerce site and have two strict rules on password selection, you know what's going to happen? Your customers will go someplace else. They don't have to deal with you. There's a study that showed, saw recently, that uh, the strictest password rules are not the places with the uh, most to lose, like banks. It's where you don't have a choice. Governments can enforce strict password rules and people want to do business with the government. And we all have to do business with the government. Employers can impose strict password rules. Stores, banks, they can't. They can't get away with it. So that's why we have popular. When, when rockyou.com was, was hacked, we looked at their, they stored their passwords in plain text, a pretty stupid move, but one, two, three, four, five, six was the most popular password. Six. It even beat out one, two, three, four, five. People decided they needed six character passwords. The clever people went six, five, four, three, two, one. Pass, <laughs> password was number three on the list. I love you was number four, and so on. Why? Because, oh, what's, why did I, it's, it's just, Network, I don't need a strong password. Password, my password is password. <laughs> or how about smartphones, which 10 years ago were pretty unimaginable. A lot of the network security architecture in most corporations is built around the assumption that the IT department issues all of the computers and controls them all and can update them all. And corporate policies and what you can and cannot do with these computers. Suddenly, everybody's walking in with their phone. And I'll tell you, someone who's just two years ago had to carry a Blackberry for work as well as this thing. I was worked for the US government for a year. Uh, this is a lot more pleasant to read my email on than the Blackberry was. People want to use their own phones, and the finance people love it. Oh, great, we don't have to go buy Blackberries for everybody. Let them use their own iPhones and Android phones. Suddenly, there's an employee-owned device where you can't control what they're doing, you can't control the software on it, you can't audit it, you're not certain of its security, but management has said, this is making people happy and save us, saving us money. Go for it. What does this do to our security architecture? It was built around this assumption that that behavior pattern couldn't exist, and now it's very common. Even though this phone, you know, right now this phone is on Pelophone and the Technion network, and what's this do? Nobody is going to recognize all of these implicit assumptions. Well, no, they're implicit. We don't stop to think about, this is the way the computer works, this is the way I'll design it. Oh yeah, the computer will get so much faster, we know Moore's law. So what do you do? One thing to do is, in different spots in your design, say, why do you think this component is secure? You still get that wrong. We're talking implicit assumptions. The best thing is, if you are in a corporation and deploy a large system. You know, I spent many years at Bell Labs and AT&T Labs. And one of the things I did very regularly was security architecture reviews. We're going to go deploy a new system. Does it look secure? Usually we'd come up with minor changes that they needed to make. But never once, in close to 30 years of association with AT&T, was I asked to come back and review a system that had been uh, fielded for five years. And it's five years worth of technology changes, five years worth of business model changes, of threat changes, and five years worth of incremental changes to this system that no one had ever stepped back and taken another fresh look at with the benefit of five more years of experience. But that's what you need to be doing because there's no way you're going to identify the assumptions that you don't know you've assumed. Another thing we need to do when trying to defend sy systems is we have to think about insecurity. You know, I sometimes joke that I've got the best job in the world because my job is to think evil thoughts, but I get to feel virtuous about it. 
So you need to know how to attack systems. I also caution my students that knowing how to attack a system is not the same as actually doing it. And there are, you know, there are still requirements for permission, but that's a separate issue. So you need to know what kinds of attacks can be launched. And you need to know why do they sometimes succeed, even if you understood the threat model correctly. And sometimes the answer is that you didn't, as we have discussed. But uh, you need to understand, you need to understand how did this fail? Why did this fail? What should have been done differently? And sometimes you can't predict. You know, no one who's trying to defend against flame could have predicted a new cryptanalytic breakthrough uh, against uh, MD5. But maybe there were other mistakes they made, like running Windows XP. The best way to be an attacker is to do what I call thinking sideways. Attacks very frequently succeed when the attacker thinks of a behavior pattern, an input pattern, that the programmer had never thought of. You know, I've been in reviews, security reviews, where I say, well, what if someone tries this? And I get these very puzzled looks from the application programmers. Well, why would somebody try that, precisely? If the answers on an exam question are A, B, and C, write D, see what happens. Maybe that's not, may not be a good strategy for passing an exam, but for breaking the computer system, it might be just exactly what was ordered. Back when I was in graduate school, and I had to teach introductory programming, this was the days of punch cards and IBM mainframes. You had to have these very peculiar cards to uh, call it JCL job control language to, to tell the mainframe which, uh, which compiler to run and so on. I didn't bother explaining to the students. I just said, you know, here's what you stick, here are these extra cards you punch and stick in front of your program. And I said, oh, okay, talk about the programming language. And every statement ends with a semicolon. And somebody typed in the job control language, didn't understand, JCL, programming language. Stuck a semicolon at the end of the JCL. They crashed the operating system. The programmer who wrote the JC, part of the JCL scanner wasn't expecting, you can't put a semicolon there. Didn't check for it. I got a bit of grief from the uh, computer center saying, why did you tell, excuse me, why did you program it this way? And I wasn't even doing security at the time. You have an exam question you don't like, try and sabotage the test. There's a saying that's been expressed in many different ways by different people, the way I phrase it. You don't go through strong security, you go around it. In fact, we even saw this in a classic Star Trek movie, the Kobayashi Maru episode. The cadets were presented with a situation, which course of action, turned out there was no right answer. They were going to lose no matter which option they tried. So Kirk, later Captain Kirk, what did he do? He hacked into the simulation computer and changed the simulation to give him a way to win. Go around the security, go around the problem. This is what atta good attackers do. Bruce Schneier tells the story about Uncle Milton's ant farms. Oh, it should be Milton, not Milton. Uncle Milton's ant farms. Educational toy for children. You go, buy a little, go to the store, buy a little ant habitat. You bring it home, no, there are no ants in the box that you bought from the store. But there's a little postcard you send off, and they'll mail you ants that you can go put into this, and children go watch the ant colony grow and so on. Great. And Bruce's friend said, I didn't know you could send live ants through the mail. And Bruce said, I didn't know I could get Uncle Milton to send ants to anybody I want them to. You put down somebody else's address on the card. Bruce is thinking about the problem. This is, Bruce is an adult, not Bruce. He was not a security guy when he was a, he was a kid. Uh, Bruce is a security guy. He thinks differently about things than most people do. It's interesting. And the answer, by the way, is in one of those book chapters that are out there. It is interesting to think about what defenses Uncle Milton could deploy and what the assumptions are behind those defenses. You can go read it later, but uh, think about it first. 
The important thing to realize is that attackers do not follow the rules. So look at the classic buffer overflow problem, which has been used in the wild for since 1988 with the Morris Internet worm. This was Morris Jr., the son of Morris Sr., who told, taught me about the three Bs. If you've worked in software development, you know about requirements documents. The requirements document will say, input lines of up to 1024 characters must be accepted. Great. The programmer reads that and writes, care buffs up 1025, leave room for the no byte at the end. Maybe a cautious programmer will say, I'll leave room for expansion, care buff 2000. And the tester, how do you test software when you're in the test department of a big development organization? You look at the requirements document, and you code a test. OK, requirement 13A, 1024 byte input lines. Type, 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 1024 bytes. It worked, passed, check it off. The attacker sees that and says, you know, reads the manual, say, input lines of 1024 bytes are accepted, and blah, blah, blah. The attacker sees that and says, cool, I wonder what will happen if I send 2,000 bytes, 3,000 bytes. If the program crashes when you try that, you say, cool. <laughs> The attacker's not following the rules. Best expressed in a very classic XKCD cartoon, Little Bobby Tables. You know, uh, it's, it's like that semicolon in the job control language that I saw about, God, more than 40, about 40 years ago now. It was a long time ago. You know, a lot of people read this and understood what happened. There was a Swedish election, somebody recently, about three years ago, somebody cast a write-in vote with drop table Val J on their write-in ballot, hoping that somebody was, go that some careless programmer was, uh, they'd sanitize their input a little bit better. I, didn't have room on the slide, but there's another example of a ballot where somebody actually tried putting some JavaScript on their ballot, or actually a, a tag to go read in JavaScript from a website to see what that was going to do to the elections commissioner. You can also, if you search a little bit with Google, find a picture of a car's license plate with the little Bobby Tables uh, script written in to try and confuse a license plate scanning camera. You, 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 you can find this very easily with Google. Can this happen? Yeah, it can happen. This is, today it's known as an SQL injection attack. It's one of the most common ways that websites get taken over. No competent programmer should make this mistake at this point. I can only conclude that too many websites are built by people who aren't competent programmers. It's also very, very important to realize that security is a systems problem. It is not achieved by little fixes here and there. You don't get security by sprinkling on crypto. You know what happens if you have a buggy website and decide to use HTTPS instead of HTTP? The intrusion detection system can't monitor the attack that's going to do a uh, SQL injection against the website. The cryptography doesn't help at all against that threat. You don't get security by, just by requiring strong passwords. There's a lovely attack from the University of Ulu some years ago, which we now know as one of the good examples of protocol fuzzing. And they did a fuzzing, they did fuzzing many variants of the input against a large collection of uh, routers. And they found that many of them, the fuzzing was effective while trying to validate the input password. Password, password can be really, really strong, but the fuzzing is going to break the, system, the security of the system before the password is validated. You don't get security by adding firewalls. All of these things can be useful. But security is a property of this, as the system as a whole. And the components interact. And sometimes it's the interactions that cause the problem. Great example. Uh, published a paper around 1990 about an early version of Kerberos. 
And Mike Merritt and I pointed out that there were times and situations where Kerberos was going to reuse the same session key. And we said cryptographically, this is not a good thing to do. You need a different key for each session. Cryptographically speaking, we're absolutely correct. Well, there were a few problems. DES, for those of you who remember, took 56-bit keys in a 64-bit field. The extra eight bits were parity bits for reflection of the hardware environment of 1974. The designers of Kerberos said, well, you know, maybe some people are going to have hardware. We don't care about parity bits and software, but maybe there's a hardware DES chip. So we really need to go have correct parity. So the generate a session key routine generated 64-bit keys with the correct parity. And then they made a dubious decision. Their software module checked the parity. Maybe right, maybe wrong, but then they did something really bad. What do you do if you're handed a key with invalid parity? My answer would be, you know, throw an exception, flag an error, refuse to do it. Their exception was, to, was their decision was to say, Oh, this key's got bad parity. It's invalid. Let me set the key to all zeros. And encrypt with all, encrypt with all zeros. <laughs> and those decisions alone would have been fine. Because every program that wrote said, called the API, it said, give me a key, which always handed back keys with correct parity. And got down to the DES module, which said, parity's correct, no problem. I'll use the 56 bits you really wanted me to use. And then Mike Merritt and I published this paper which said you need really separate session keys. And there was no API for doing that in this version of Kerberos. So someone said, okay, my application will generate its own keys. Oh, just give me a random 64-bit string, which is only, yeah, only one chance in 256, you, you got it, only one chance in 256 of having the right parity. So with probability 255 out of 256, all of your encrypted telnet sessions were using a key of all zeros. And this persisted for years. By the way, this was open source. Many eyes did not make all bugs shallow because those eyes weren't looking. It was the interaction between the DES hardware spec, the API, my paper, and a careless application program who didn't realize all the subtleties that caused this problem. Other examples involving Java and firewalls, it's the interaction that caused the problem. Another simpler example. A friend of mine says that insecurity is like entropy. You can't destroy it, but you can move it around. I have a file. It's not stored securely, so I'm going to encrypt it to protect the file. I've moved the insecurity from the file the insecurity of the key and the algorithm. Presumably the algorithm's strong, presumably I can protect this key better. But if I lose the key, I have lost the file. I've made it protected against one problem, I'm now risking another. It's great to encrypt backup media or store it off-site, but I better protect the keys that I've used to encrypt that backup medium, and I better not store the keys with the, with the backup media. Suppose I am interested in reading encrypted traffic to a website. Well, here's traffic, it's encrypted with SSL and RC4 and so on, go read the specs. How do I do it? Well, the academic approach might be, let me crack RSA. And it's only a 1024-bit key. Maybe I can factor that, and then I can read all the traffic of this website. It's a lovely, straightforward approach. It's also very difficult. Maybe the NSA can read 1024-bit RSA, but there are no papers in the open literature that describe being able to factor general 1024-bit numbers. At the very least, it's very, very expensive. Maybe I can break RC4. That seems plausible. It's known to be a weak cipher. There are rumors out there that the NSA can read it in real time. True or not, who knows? 
Maybe I can break AES. Seems more doubtful. But these are the straightforward, nice academic approaches. Maybe I'll hack a certificate authority and issue myself a fake certificate in the name of this company and intercept their traffic. This works. Iran apparently or allegedly did that with DigiNotar. Maybe I can find a flaw in the SSL implementation. We've had two lovely ones lately, Heartbleed and GoToFail. Maybe I'll just go hack the web server to send the plain text. Maybe I'll bribe the server site employed to plant a back door for me. The cryptography alone isn't enough. All of these things are in theory possible, with the possible exception of cracking AES. You know, the NSA claims it's good enough for top secret traffic. Maybe they're even telling the truth. There's IAD, they probably are. All of these other things we know work. The cryptography alone is not going to do the job. Here's an example I'll be revisiting in more detail uh, tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry, a later talk. But this is a diagram of a typical web server farm. Yeah. Up here is the internet. You've got these routers and inverse proxies, and more routers and web servers and databases. It's great. It looks, turns out it has some very lovely security properties because the inverse proxies are only forwarding ports 80 and 443. So is there an open SSH port on the web server? Doesn't matter. You can't get at it from the internet. Why not? Because the inverse proxy is not forwarding that port number. We get a wonderful firewall effect as a side effect of the load balancer. We're there for performance and reliability reasons. And the databases are even more secure because even if the proxies were for forwarding 22 or what have you, you'd have to, to hack through the web service to get at the databases. But there's this link at the lower right to the back end and the rest of the corporation. What's protecting that link? Security is great from the front, but not from the back. If I'm a clever attacker, guess how I'm going to come in? Or SQL injection attack, of course, is going to pass right through and be misinterpreted by the database servers. So how do we avoid these traps? We start by drawing the system diagram. And for every node and every link on this diagram, we say, assume that this has been compromised. What are the effects? What are the risks? What do we lose? We also try to assess the odds of a particular compromise happening. Sometimes you say, I think this system is strong, or this algorithm is strong, or what have you. I don't know what I'm doing now. And what are the consequences of a penetration of that particular system? We have to look at every node and every link and understand. And maybe you can say, this link is within the data center. I probably don't need to encrypt it. But then you might say, this node over here is pretty vulnerable. It's on the same LAN. Does that make the link vulnerable? All of these decisions interact. And in a serious situation, that's to say, where the odds on penetration look high enough, or the, or the consequences are serious enough, then you have to look at a defense. You know, uh, Google did not think it needed to encrypt its inter-data center links, because these were leased circuits, data center to data center, looked very secure. Who's going to, yeah, we know about routing attacks on the internet, or DNS attacks on the internet, but who's got the capability of tapping into a uh, hundreds of megabit a second least circuit. Hello, NSA. They got the threat model wrong. So is a given subsystem secure? Here's a web server. There's a database. There's a mailer. There's a whatever. Is this secure? If we could look at a particular system and say this is or is not secure, we'd be in a lot better shape overall. But we can use certain heuristics to tell. In fact, we usually cannot tell. 
Most of us don't control the operating system, have no visibility into it. We don't, we may have a nice open source web server or a database engine, we still can't tell. But some software's got a bad reputation. You know, 15 years ago, the send mail package was notoriously insecure. You didn't want it anywhere near a high security system. It's gotten a lot better, or at least no one's looking at it anymore. Today, other packages seem to have the bad security reputation. Things can change. In 2002, I think, 2001, 2002, the Gartner Group warned its corporate consulting outfit, warned its clients, do not run IIS, Microsoft's web server. They called it basically horribly hor and terminally insecure. And Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer got religion about security. Microsoft has spent a quarter of a, mil quarter of a billion dollars improving the security of its products. And now IIS is a reasonable product. And the Gartner Group withdrew that recommendation. But sometimes reputation does give you a pretty good picture on it. Another thing to look at is what is the complexity of a system? Most security flaws are due to buggy code. The bigger the system, the more complex system, the buggier it is. And anytime I see a horribly large, complex system that has to be uh, very, very secure, I get very nervous. This is one of the original reasons for firewalls. And this is what, something that Bill Cheswick and I wrote 20 years ago. Firewalls then were a lot simpler than the code they were trying to protect. And that's one of the things that protected the enterprise behind the firewall. I, you know, I, I can still show, show you the slides I used in a panel session, the Oakland conference in 1994, where I said, the purpose of a firewall is to keep the bad guys away from the buggy code. There are some techniques you can use to assess security. Microsoft developed something called RASC, the Relative Attack Surface Quotient. I'll give it as an example of what you can do. It's not an absolute measure of security. It's a way to compare two alternatives. And what you do is you look at every potential weak spot in a, sub, in a subsystem. An open network connection, a privileged program, a weak access control list. All of these things are potential weak points. Why, say, a privileged program? Privileged programs, if they're not written correctly, can be tricked into doing the wrong thing. If a program doesn't have privileges, it's not nearly as risky. So you just add up how many weak spots does this particular system have, and you weight them because some weak spots are more dangerous than others. And you add up the score, you get the RASC score for alternative one versus alternative two. Again, you don't know absolutely which is more secure. You might say that one's got a higher RAS score, but was developed with a better development methodology. It's just a way to try to assess the relative difference between the two programs. And you compare the different alternatives. This alternative is more secure. So at least at one point, I don't know if it's still true, Microsoft Security Group would not allow a product to ship if it was less secure by this metric than what was out there today. They wanted continually improving security. New feature, what does it do to the RASC score? If there's a problem, maybe you need another layer of defense. I'm going to give an example, and I don't have time to go into every piece of this in great detail. But I'm also talking about something that doesn't really exist yet the so-called Internet of Things. Internet of Things. All the gadgetry that uh, will be connected to the Internet in some fashion. You know, my, how, I, uh, my house has uh, Nest thermostats, Internet connected. Does this expose my house to some kinds of attack? Maybe. I'm sorry? Non-vulnerability. The vulnerabilities that I have seen didn't look particularly serious to me, but there are some. Uh, so, you know, uh, Wi-Fi or 
Okay, expose my Wi-Fi and password. Okay, it's a unique. I use, I use a unique password for, for for this. I do not reuse the same password for it. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll go stick it on a separate network and some net in the house. At one point in the house, I had four different networks. My external network, my work network, which is VPN into work, network for my wife for me doing innocuous things, and what I called teen net for my teen, my then teenagers. I wanted to isolate them from me and me from them. <laughs> I'm a security guy. I do strange things. So the Internet of Things. I, you know, you know, I, uh, I assume a wide variety. Of, I'm just calling them things. You know, thermostats, you know, Fitbits, uh, cars, whatever. And these things, you can't generally talk to them directly. Be, from the outside, because we've got these NAT boxes in the way, and a few other, a few other reasons. Uh, can't talk to them directly, so frequently these things are going to speak to a hub or a controller of some sort. And that's going to go out through the home router out to the internet and talk to some vendor server in the cloud. You know, and if uh, my exercise center, sensor wants to tell my hot water heater, Okay, here's Steve on his way home from, from out from a bike ride or something. Turn on the hot water. He's going to want to shower. He's going to go, you know, from the exercise sensor up to one vendor server, over to another vendor server, and back down. Should work, right? Plausible architecture. Said it doesn't. We don't. I don't say it's going to work this way because this net, this Internet of Things doesn't really exist yet today in any mature fashion. It's just it's just starting, but. Of there are a few things in bold to show that uh, it might. What happens if one of these things are hacked? So. One failure mode, perhaps, is that some link isn't encrypted and can be attacked. What are the consequences? It turns out that for the Internet of Things, this is not a, mostly not a serious issue, at least if I have decent Wi-Fi security at home, because in general, it is not easy to, to eavesdrop on the Internet unless you're the NSA. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's a harder attack and it's generally a targeted attack. An opportunistic attacker is not uh, and even a fairly uh, low-grade targeteer is not going to be able to eavesdrop on most internet connections from a home to a vendor. If I'm using it at a uh, Wi-Fi hotspot, it's a different story. But from my house to the internet is, pre is pretty secure. But if I am worried about it, link encryption with SSL is relatively straightforward. Relatively so, I can say, okay, here's the links, I'll encrypt them. The servers can be hacked, the hubs can be hacked, or the devices, the things themselves can be hacked. What are the consequences? Well, the servers are relatively hard to protect because they have to be out there on the internet open to any thing that wants to talk to them. <coughs> They're listening to many places by design. It's complex code written by application programmers, not security people. So let's assume that a server can be hacked. It looks like a very vulnerable spot. What can a hacked server do? It can send bad commands to devices. It can send bad firmware to devices. And it can intercept and steal authentication data. So what do we, uh, what do, we do about it? We could say that firmware has to be digitally signed. Because that is something that's taking place in the development shop, not this internet accessible ser uh, server. Can the development shop be hacked? Of course. Can a code signing key be stolen? Absolutely. Stuxnet did it, or used such stolen keys. No one has the slightest clue how it got those stolen keys, but since Stuxnet is widely attributed to uh, intelligence agencies, we can assume that they had ample ways to do that. Still, this is a fairly strong defense against the kind of attacker that we think might be going after the Internet of Things. If we think the Andromedans want to go mess with my thermostat, 
then I worry more about firmware signing attacks. How do I protect these things against bad data being sent to them? I don't want my thermostat turned up to uh, 40 degrees Celsius, uh, whether it's the heating or the cooling thermostat. It's going to make my house rather unpleasant. Well, it turns out that you can put in, design these things with an extra level of sanity checking. So the Nest documentation explains that it will not heat past a certain amount, and it will not cool past a, below a certain amount, no matter what. Maybe you can even do this in hardware. So the air conditioning will never come on on a Nest thermostat when the temperature is below, oh, I think it's about 8 or 10 degrees Celsius. That's my defense there, because that server can be hacked. And finally, to deal with authentication mechanisms, authentication data being compromised, I don't use passwords at that level. I use some sort of asymmetric cryptography authentication scheme. There's nothing that's, e there's no secret that's known to the server that can be used to spoof authentication. Again, this is a notional architecture which shows how I can go about the analysis. What about the hub? Well, the hubs are not directly exposed to the internet. They're behind mat boxes. Can someone get in? Yes, but it's a two-stage attack. They'd probably have to infect one of my home PCs and then use it to attack the hub. Or maybe this, an infected server could attack the hub directly. So hubs are a lot safer than servers in that sense. On the other hand, the servers are professionally run, the software will be updated. A lot of these hubs are going to be deployed and forgotten. They'll be running 15-year-old versions of Windows XP and uh, never updated. They're mostly, though, mostly though, they're message relays. There's little incremental risk above what the risks are to the devices if the server is hacked. So what I, my best defense here seems to be to deploy intrusion detection. Look for strange things coming at the hub and sound an alert. Messages from one thing to another thing are not going to go directly. So they're going to go up to a server and then back down. And I want to do intrusion detection at the hubs. This means the messages cannot be encrypted at the hubs. They will have to be in the plain text. But I want them to be authenticated end to end. And that, by the way, introduces a new risk. I have a much more complex key management problem now. I need end-to-end -end authentication, but hop-by-hop -hop encryption. Is this more or less risky? I don't have an answer to that. It's something that requires a detailed analysis. But I know that complicated key management is really, really difficult to get right. On the other hand, the cryptographic threats are probably not the most serious because we're not assuming that intelligence agencies are interested in my hot water heater. And if a thing gets hacked, again, it's most, many of them are relatively well protected. They're only talking to their hubs. They can report bad data. They can carry out bad commands. Not great, but most of these things are not in a position to do any harm with really bad things. Oh, the light won't turn on. Well, my light sometimes don't turn on because the squirrel is chewed through the power line again. But every two years, I lose power for a couple of hours for some reason like that. You know, it's an inconvenience, but I can cope with it. And if I find that my house, I can't turn on the lights, and all my neighbors can, well, it's not the squirrel. I can, I'll cope, I'll recover. Again, the sanity checking is going to help. And then there's the component I didn't draw on that diagram, the people who are operating these systems. You know, I might not want my kids changing the thermostat setting, because my son might want, might want it warmer in the house than I want it. His room's a little bit cool in the winter. But if I have a guest staying over, well, they're presumably adults, and they might, uh, I might want to let them. 
I've got to go manage all this crazy access control. I've got to go manage, manage the key management. We know that normal people can't do this sort of thing very well, especially when the interfaces were designed by programmers instead of normal people. <laughs> and uh, I, I love email encryption packages where they'll say something like, export public key. Whereas what they should say is something like, allow somebody else to send you a secret message. Makes much more sense. Any of you remember the SSL implementation, the first version of the Netscape browser, you click on View Certificate, it popped up in a pop-up window with a nice scroll work borders, like a nice certificate paste on the wall. That made it a certificate. Try to explain what a certificate is to most people, they'll look at you like you're crazy. But good, good exercise. In fact, I'll go through it right now. How many of you know what a certificate is? I think you have most people in this room. How many of you have ever validated the certificate of a site you want to buy something from? <laughs> many few people. How many people always do it? Oh, two people. That's the most, most I've ever gotten any one audience. And we understand the risks. We know what these things are. You can't rely on people to do this stuff. Access control lists, in the form that's been with us since Multics, People cannot get them right. It is not, we, we did a study with privacy settings on Facebook. And uh, in our sample, not one person got all of their access control list settings correct. Not one. A lot of people, almost everybody was sharing stuff they intended to hide, but a substantial number of people were hiding things they intended to share. Either way, Facebook can't be happy. We have to design these systems. It's another failure mode of the system. Don Norman, probably one of the top experts on human-computer interaction, wrote a lovely, uh, I'll call it an essay, it was really more of a rant, saying that uh, if, if the valve keeps failing, you keep replacing the valve, you don't yell at the people who are running the waters for the valve failing. You redesign the valve or get a better valve. Why do we blame people when they can't use these incomprehensible interfaces on our computer systems? The overall risk ranking here, the server compromise risk is probably the most serious. Most of the communications are going through it. It's the most exposed component, and it's the best target for an attacker because it can't control so many different things. I suspect that usability errors by the people at the end system including clicking on attachments they shouldn't click on and infecting their home machines, to, which will then attack their things and their hubs, is the second biggest risk. And today's status, most of the links aren't encrypted, even though that's the easy part. Few, very few companies are thinking about usable security. And that's a really serious problem, so we're probably in trouble with this stuff. Me with the Nest thermostats, well before I got it, I was stuffing my class lectures about the risks of hacked home thermostats. I decided that it was a risk worth taking. What are some of the assumptions that I made in this design? One, the Andromedans are not the enemy here. We're interested more in the opportunistic attackers. Maybe I should worry more about targeted attacks from crazy neighbors. Some of my neighbors are a little crazier than others, but not, they're not technically sophisticated. <coughs> Active attacks are hard on the internet, diverting traffic. Houses are isolated from the internet by these NAT box firewalls. The cryptography that you can implement on these things, if you chose to, is probably secure enough. And the vendors are trustworthy and not trying to subvert security. Privacy maybe, but not security. But that last point about the Andromedans, they could probably hack the servers, the vendor's firmware signing machine. If I decide that the Andromedans are the enemy, I have to go revisit this architecture. <coughs> <coughs> and if they're really trying to get you, they'll tamper with the schematics of the hardware safety mechanism so that, that so it can be overridden if necessary, if they want it to be. Can they do it? They're the Andromedans, they can do it. 
So, what are we trying to protect and against whom? How powerful are the adversaries? Who can hack which elements of your systems? And how do you stop them? And this is what we have to think about when we're designing computer systems.